Fill Easter baskets this year with the adorable children's book, Jesus Calling, the Story of Easter. You can find Jesus Calling, the Story of Easter on special at booksamillion.com. I would tell people that are dealing with a lot of that loneliness and isolation right now to just remember the reputation of God, to remember what He's done before. Write down a list of all the things that you've been through in life where you thought maybe that it was the end or it was the era that was too much for you to handle. And I did that the other day and it really changed my life. And I just gave myself a little history lesson of what God has done before and it gave me so much courage to believe that He could do it again. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Our guests this week demonstrate how God can take ordinary people and instill a dream within them to have a life of lasting impact. Pastor of the Los Angeles Dream Center, Matthew Barnett, and children's book illustrator, Richard Cowdery. As people all across the world retreat into their homes during this global pandemic, some people are on the front lines, serving and helping those in need. Matthew Barnett is the pastor of the Los Angeles Dream Center, a 24-hour facility that helps people who are homeless, going through drug or alcohol dependency, and many other needs. Matthew tells us how they're serving the LA area during this tough period where job losses run rampant. Homeless people are at risk, and a large percentage of school children aren't getting the meals that would normally be provided to them. My name is Matthew Barnett. I'm the pastor of the Los Angeles Dream Center and we are open 24 hours a day helping people seven days a week who are homeless going through drug and alcohol recovery or in any type of need we house 700 people every day who are homeless families that are homeless people that have drug and alcohol addictions that we take in every second of the day literally the coronavirus epidemic has changed everything of what we normally do and it was a Thursday right before our church service and it just got announced. I knew that immediately we needed to shut down service and not have our church service and prepare for Monday because we knew what was coming next. And that was a public school system in LA, which is the second largest in the nation. Children were not gonna have meals. Families were gonna be struggling and there was gonna be a major issue. So I said, guys, two things we need to do right now. We need to calm people's fears by not having church service and gathering thousands of people in our church building. And number two, We need to be ready to meet the need on Monday. Calm the fears and meet the need. And I said, we're going to open up for 11 hours on Monday. We're just going to see what happens. And we're going to feed people through a drive-thru so nobody's worrying about big crowds or shoulder-to-shoulder contact or anything like that. People are stopping by three times a day for lunch. and I mean, mean, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so when they're coming by, we have a 30-second encounter. And we just try to provide the greatest 30 seconds of people's lives. You know, we always hear that people are changed in a moment, they're changed in an instant. But we're really kind of seeing that become a reality now because when people are coming through, we are just loving on them, saying quick prayers without touching them, you know, through the roof of their car or through the window and, and just providing a spark that keeps people going through the day. I mean, just staying in the neighborhood and not leaving And being there for people is one of the best things you can do in a time of crisis to know that you're not going to run, you're not going to leave, you're still going to be a steady force of change in in the community. And the city of LA came alongside of us and said, you guys are one of the most essential places to stay open during this time. And the the mayor and the councilmen were begging us to keep going. And uh, so we just feel like we were born for such a time as this. You know, we've been faithful in LA for 25 years in this old hospital and housing people. We're still doing it during the virus, all of that. Um, as the city brings us needs or people that aren't sick that we could take in. But in all the 25 years of feeding 1,500 hot meals every day, we really believe that we are born for this era that we are facing right now. What led me to this place really is is I was 20 years of age when I started pastoring and I was sitting in the backseat of a van. And so the earthquakes and the riots and all that took place in LA, it wasn't a time a lot of people were coming back into the city during the gang violence. And my dad was trying to find a church plant. So we had 10 people in a van to try to take over this little old building in a rough part of town. So I was a 20 year old kid in the backseat, just helping my dad, you know, do whatever he needed to do. And he just wept and he said, son, this church is going to be sold and we're going to lose a great pillar and icon that had been there for 80 years in the neighborhood. But really, the times change, the demographic change. And he said, something's got to happen. He said, would you help me come and pastor for three months? 
And I wasn't even a pastor. I had no experience, but he told me to come for three months. And so I just moved my desk on the sidewalk and had three bags of food and started handing it out to people in the neighborhood. And I lived with three homeless guys on the street that we took in. And that was the beginning, um, just a desk on the sidewalk, talking to all the moms of the neighborhood and asking if we could serve them. And of course, the first three months I struggled greatly. But then I took a prayer walk one night and I really did hear um, the impression of the Holy Spirit that just spoke to me and said, I want you to build a 24 hour church in the middle of this city that would never sleep, that would be open for people all hours of the day. And it became a revelation. And one day the, we saw the miracle of this big old 410,000 square foot hospital called the Queen of Angels Hospital. And to make a long story short, the Catholic Church was going to sell it for $16 million to Paramount Studios. But when we approached them and told them what our vision was, they sold it to us for $3.9 million. And in 18 months, miracles happened to allow us to pay for that 400,000 square foot building on the Hollywood freeway that's open all hours of the day for people. You know, LA is expensive. Everyone's two weeks away from being evicted. And we're, it's just constantly taking in families, homeless veterans. And th these are the kind of people, and every program that we built at the Dream Center is one year. And the reason why it's one year is because we want to give people the luxury of time to change. When people don't have time to change, they act in desperation. So we just try to take away that survival mindset and get them into a place they can take a deep breath, they can get into the Word of God, they can start growing as people, and then they can start rebuilding their lives. You know, we have 275 men and women in our drug and alcohol rehab program, and we also take in 30 people a month that are sentenced to us to the Dream Center instead of the prison sentence. So we're dealing with prison reform and then homeless families. we got about 220 people that are families that are homeless, that um, have nowhere to go. They show up in their cars, precious little children. There's someone to pray for them, to hold their hand through the process, helping them get to point A to point B in their journey. And so I think that the strongest element is, is that time aspect, to see God begin to evolve in their life. You know, we've used so much great curriculum, a Jesus Calling. It's been a part of our recovery programs. And just people come into the program and detox. They're learning how to communicate with God, learning how to hear the voice of God, le learning how God speaks to people. And so we just incorporate it into our recovery program. What I love about the most is it's revolutionary to people who come in because most of the people we come in have no concept of the gospel. And so when they read something like that, you know, their minds are kind of blown by everything. You know, like, oh my God, like crazy, are you kidding me? Like the reaction is always like a little child that gets to go to Disneyland for the first time when they hear about this incredible relationship they can have with God and the way God speaks to them. Here's a passage from January 5th of Jesus Calling. You can achieve the victorious life through living in deep dependence on me. People usually associate victory with success, not failing or stumbling not making mistakes. But those who are successful in their own strength tend to go their own way, forgetting about me. It is through problems and failure, weakness and neediness that you learn to rely on me. True dependence is not simply asking me to bless what you have decided to do. It is coming to me with an open mind and heart, inviting me to plant my desires within you. I may infuse you within a dream that seems far beyond your reach. You know that in yourself you cannot achieve such a goal. Thus begin your journey of profound reliance on me. It is a faith walk, taken one step at a time, leaning on me as much as you need. This is not a path of continual success, but of multiple failures. However, each failure is followed by a growth spurt, nourished by increased reliance on me. Enjoy the blessedness of a victorious life through deepening your dependence on me. You can stress over the many that don't make it, and many do go back to their drug addiction, and not everyone succeeds who comes through our program, but I try to focus on the ones that do make it, and that's what keeps me going. 25 years, you go through a series of emotions. You go through wanting to quit. You actually go through the scenarios of your exit strategy. I mean, you go through a lot in those moments. And usually when, when I'm dealing with those moments, it's usually a couple things that cause me to get to that place. Number one, to be honest with you, as a pastor, 
there's times I get away from the spiritual disciplines, and I know that sounds crazy and very vulnerable, but um, I get into busy doing a lot of things, and I forget to encourage myself in the Lord and get great resources to help me, and and um, I just kind of, I get tough in the flesh, but I get weak in the spirit, and that's a big difference. There's also times where burnout to me can be a lack of vision, where I just get to the place in my life where I say, you know, God's done something so great in 25 years, if it all ended tomorrow, it would be a great run, you know, and you get to that place where you kind of get settled in, in a level of, uh, of success. So those are the two big components is either I'm not dreaming big enough in the season when I feel inspired by God, or number two, I just completely disconnect and get to the place to where, you know, I just get cold spiritually and, and yet I just do all these things in the flesh. It's quite a cycle in, in 25 years that you go on in the struggle and the journey of God bringing you back to his heart and sometimes a wandering heart and you get away from the, the most important thing and you're, you're doing the urgent but you're not responding to the importance. But you can go through cycles of a long time of, of not being in, in the right place and yet God's still blessing the work because he loves the people you're trying to serve and he'll still use you anyways. <laughs> I'm laughing right now because my book, you know, One Small Step coming out April 7th is <laughs> quite interesting because we really lived out the evidence of that book. And the book is about not being afraid to listen to those nudges of the Holy Spirit that tell you to do something that might be uncommon for what you're even capable of doing or maybe even capable of doing. It's getting our heart to respond more to those everyday challenges and nudges of the Holy Spirit that speak to us in ways that are outside our comfort zone to help other people. And boy, has this really <laughs> become evidence of that. The book talks about so many times of our life where we experience that. And even now, of course, uh, just said, we're gonna open up this building on a Monday and help people. And now it's turning into uh, 75,000 people a week being served. But the whole book takes you on a journey of, the, of 25 years of just radical living and responding and whether it be saying something you've always felt, but something in your heart tells you don't say it, to uh, all those little things and those nudges that start to set us free when we step out and not be overwhelmed by fear when those moments speak. The book just deals so much with the little things that we can do to make a big impact. I mean, from the isolation, from the everyday trips to the grocery store, it's, it's really made for this era, to be honest. And, when I was writing it, I didn't realize I was writing it for this such a time as this moment. It's so strange how God would use something to speak into the future. And, and you know, it's tough because we're doing all this day-to-day -day work and trying to help as many people possible. It's truly extraordinary what happens and we just kind of got started and believe that miracles would come along the way. To learn more about how to help others through the Dream Center or find a Dream Center near you, visit dreamcenter.org. And if you're interested in reading more about Matthew's journey, you can find his new book, One Small Step, The Life-Changing Adventure of Following God's Nudges, everywhere books are sold. Stay tuned to Richard Cowdery's story after a brief message about a beautiful new edition of Jesus Calling that will help prepare your heart for Easter. The Easter season is filled with joy and hope. Now, there's a new way to focus on the holiday with the new book, Jesus Calling for Easter. With 50 Jesus Calling devotions selected just for the Lent and Easter season, Jesus Calling for Easter includes scripture verses alongside breathtaking imagery and exquisite design. Jesus Calling for Easter makes a stunning gift for those who love Jesus Calling and would like a new way to observe the Easter season. To learn more about this beautiful new edition of Jesus Calling, please visit jesuscalling.com books. From the time he was a young boy, Richard Cowdery always had a crown, a pencil, or a pen in hand, anything to help him create the vivid drawings he still brings to life today as the illustrator of the adorable children's books characters like Marley the Dog from Marley and Me and social media sensation Fiona the Hippo. But growing up, Richard never dreamed of success for himself. By the time he reached high school, he was jaded and without direction. But thanks to two teachers who believed in him, Richard found a new path that would spark a dream that had always been inside him. I'm Richard Cowdery from Gambier, Ohio, and I'm the illustrator of the Fiona books. I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. Fortunately, the house I grew up in backed up to woods that went all the way to the Ohio River. So I spent 
a lot of my youth in, in the woods and just climbing trees and catching salamanders and all kinds of stuff like that. And looking back, that was important to who I am in my career and that I ha have a real love for nature and have always enjoyed being in nature and currently live actually out in the country in Ohio now, out in Amish country. So that's been something consistent through my life. I can't remember a time when I didn't have a crayon or a pencil or a marker in my hand. Uh, and my mother, I've asked her, and, and she says, yeah, I can't remember you not drawing. So it's always been there. And, and uh, when I went off to school, I was recognized immediately for that. So it has always been kind of my identity. Strangely enough, I wasn't a very good student, and it would be hard to find me in a, a library for any other reason than I loved medical books. I loved the uh, Gray's Anatomy books and would go and look at those. They were big, illustrated anatomy books, and they had all the bones and muscles and organs and all the different parts of the body, just amazing paintings. So I spent a lot of time on my own, a lot of time drawing and just doing my own thing, which later on got me into a lot of trouble. But as a young kid, I was very inquisitive and I did not fit the traditional learning style of schools. And back then they thought that was a discipline problem, that I was you know, being rebellious or something to sit and draw. I don't know why they kept passing me on and on because I was like a, a strong D student, you know, D minus really. So I get to high school and my parents were divorced at that point. So I had no discipline and really no guidance or anybody, you know, watching out for me. So I ended up hanging out with the wrong crowd and becoming involved in a lot of bad stuff, a lot of partying and just hanging out pretty much with the wrong crowd. And I had a, uh, an art teacher that was a much older man. So to me, he, you know, wasn't very relatable. So I'm flunking art, you know, the thing that I <laughs> excelled at. And uh, what I would do is in my science or English or whatever class, if it was test day, I'd zip through and answer the most obvious questions that I knew enough to pass, and I'd flip the test over and draw. Very elaborate, detailed drawings. And my friends, the other classmates, knew that I could draw very well, so they would hand me their notebooks or jackets or whatever and ask me, hey, can you draw Farrah Fawcett? <laughs> and back in the 70s, Mr. Koenig became aware of that so on his own accord, he went around and gathered up as many of those drawings and notebooks and tests that he could find. And he made a little portfolio for me. And he drove from Cincinnati, Ohio, up to Columbus, uh, Columbus College of Art and Design. And he went to admissions and he put, you know, my drawings in front of them. And he said, I have a kid who's got a lot of talent, but he's a lot of trouble. And I was a lot of trouble at that point. You know, you have to imagine I had long red hair and a um, pretty wild kid. I'm 17 years old. I'm partying heavily. And that was pretty much the center of my life was looking for the next party. And so I hadn't even considered college. In fact, I didn't, didn't know about him, Mr. Koenig, making that trip till my graduation night. And my name was read off, you know, Richard Cowdery, scholarship, Columbus College of Art and Design. That's when I and my family found out about the scholarship. So in college, as I think, most colleges, most college age kids, you start to ask the questions. What is life about? Why am I here? Where am I going? For me, 
where this talent, where did that come from? And so did the people I hung out with. And so we would have discussions about philosophy and spirituality. And in fact, we all uh, checked into the Eastern religions. And so by the fourth, end of the fourth year, I was pretty jaded about school and life and everything and uh, had partied a lot and tried just about everything the world has to offer. To me, it was just so four years, five years of college, I get out, I'll work 40 years and die. That's really what it comes to. I mean, a little melancholy, but um, I'm an artist. So my senior year in college, I had an instructor, his name was Mr. Drummond. Everybody wanted to be in his class. So when you went to register, his classes would be filled immediately. So I, the first four years, it was a five-year college. The first four years, I did not get into any of his classes. So I finally, that fifth year, I get Mr. Drummond's class. I get to sit in his anatomy drawing, I think it was, class. But we're sitting there drawing halfway through class. Um, he's in the back and I just hear, Caldry in the hall. I went out in the hallway with him and said, sit down. And I sat down and he said, I've watched you for four years. I've watched you try everything. He said, when are you going to try Jesus? And really didn't have much of an answer. He pulled out his Bible and, you know, and it was very worn and he opened it and he had it clipped, the Gospel of John. And he said, I would just ask that you read just this section. This is called the Gospel of John. John was a buddy to Jesus, and he wrote about Jesus and his life. And he said, I just challenge you to take, what, will take you an hour to read that? Just read it and pray if you feel inspired, and bring me my Bible back. And then after class, I went back to my apartment and pushed the beer cans aside and sat and started reading the Gospel of John. And by the end of it, and that was, you know, I was 21 and 60 now, so 40 years ago, and I still cannot actually come up with the words to describe what happened. I knew the answers. I knew who I was, why I was. I knew what was ahead. I knew what was behind, you know, my family, everything. And I was just like, wow. <laughs> and, you know, excited isn't even the right word. I didn't know what to do with that excitement. The other religions, it came back to me and what I could do. Whereas I read about God atoning for my sin, it was already done, and all I had to do was trust, believe and trust, and give all that gunk over to him. And he would take care of that. Not to worry about that, he has it. And that alone was enough. Have you ever seen Mr. Holland's opus? He's a high school teacher. He gets to the end of his career and feels like, what was that about? And all these students come back and celebrate his life and answer his, what was that about? They come back and tell him, you know, I'm in a symphony, I'm this and that, you know, all these people who just witness to his, you know, part that he played in their lives. I think actually 12 years later, so, my wife and I, we go to that movie on a Friday night, and I'm sitting there watching this movie, and the Holy Spirit is all over me, <laughs> going, you never said thank you to Mr. Koenig. And the next morning, I called Cincinnati Information and said, is there a Lewis Koenig alive still? Because he was old when I had him. I called, and I came, here's an old man's voice. And I said, 
were you an art teacher at Oak Hills High School? And he said, yes, I was. And I said, I don't know if you'll remember me, but Rick, I was Rick then, Caldry. And I, before I could get anything else out, he said, oh yeah, tall, red hair. You went to CCAD. I said, yes. And I married four kids. I'm an illustrator. I'm in art. But most importantly, I was introduced to Christ at school. So I'm a Christian. I've got this wonderful family and a wonderful career. None of it happens without you. I said, I owe you everything. And I don't think I even said thank you. And he was very touched. And we ended up forming a really great relationship. And, you know, I saw the teachers as adversaries, but the teachers love you and they're here for you. I have a real love for nature. And I think part of my testimony would be I could look at a tree and almost be emotional just at looking at the detail and the beauty of it. And um, so I was, I think at a young age, even aware that there must be a God to create the uh, animals and the woods and just all of nature is beautiful to me, always has been. And that's still where I go for uh, when I need a break, even though, <laughs> even though I live in the country, I still, uh, my wife and I like to go to the parks and we enjoy that very much. Now I have my quiet time, just try to read the word, but my wife is very much into devotionals and she has been reading Jesus Calling for a while. And this morning I asked her, what would you say about it? And she said that it is so personal and has made Christ involved in the small details of her life, just knowing that he cares about supper, if it's something that is touching her or other people, whatever. You know, it can be the smallest details that that book has really opened her eyes to the intimacy of Christ in our lives. July 30th, worship me in the beauty of holiness. I created beauty to declare the existence of my holy being, a magnificent rose, a hauntingly glorious sunset, oceanic splendor, all these things were meant to proclaim my presence in the world. Most people rush past these proclamations without giving them a second thought. How precious are my children who are awed by nature's beauty. This opens them up to my holy presence. Even before you knew me personally, you responded to my creation with wonder. Mm. This is a gift and it carries responsibility with it declare my glorious being to the world. The whole earth is full of my radiant beauty, my glory. I was an illustrator mainly with companies and design studios and stuff doing individual pieces. I got to do the Super Bowl artwork one year, which was very cool. You know, so I'm hap a happy illustrator and I get a call from HarperCollins and I was one of three artists they were considering for the children's version of Marley and Me. And I said, who's Marley and Me? <laughs> so they sent me a book and I started reading it next to my yellow lab. And so I'm like, oh, I have to do this book. So I got to illustrate Marley, Bad Dog Marley. And it went to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. So suddenly my career, which was going this way, you know, with individual corporate stuff, er, now, you're a, now you're a children's book illustrator. We go 10 years later, my wife starts telling me about this little hippo uh, born at the Cincinnati Zoo and born premature, and they didn't expect her to live. Um, and they called in nurses from Children's Hospital who helped like put an IV in her arm and stuff. And, you know, we're nurturing her to life. You know, it was just a very compelling story. And so every night I'd get home from my studio and I'd say, you know, what's, what's Fiona doing today? How's she doing? And so Cindy would tell me and show me Facebook stuff about Fiona. She had fans all over the world who had been watching and praying for her and sending love notes and stuff to the zoo. 
And it just dawned on me that she would make a great children's book character. And I called the zoo, not thinking that I could get through, because who uses the phone anymore? But they put me through to the right guy. You know, I told him, hey, I'm the Marley guy, which was my pass to get into a lot of art director's rooms. And uh, I said, you know, I've done this before, taken a real character and made them into a children's book character. And uh, I said, I think you have a very compelling story with Fiona, and she would make a great children's book character. And he said, yeah, she would. Well, the first book being Fiona the Hippo stayed fairly close to her story at the beginning, where talking about her being born this tiny little hippo, and, and then by the end of the first book, she's made friends with all the other zoo animals. And it's just a very sweet story, and it, it's a great introduction to her. The second book was a uh, Christmas book, and we were invited on all the TV networks in Cincinnati, and you know we could tell that there was a real love for her and love for the book. And so I don't know when, but the decision was made for a third book. Uh, Fiona, it's bedtime, so it's a bedtime story. And uh, where she is the central character through the first two books, almost every page has Fiona in the middle doing something. This book, she's in the background. She's telling all the zoo animals good night. And so, you know, the cheetah and the polar bear and the sloth and the meerkat, they're all the stars of the story. And again, Fiona is just kind of going through saying good night to everybody. And it's a beautiful book. I started getting calls from schools asking me to come speak. I hate standing up in front of people. So I just prayed and just offered it up to the Lord and said, if you really want me to do this, I'll do it. But I really don't want to do it. And uh, he made it pretty clear that I was supposed to. Um, so I take the attitude of my wife and I pray before each school visit. And I know, again, it's not about me. So I'm looking mainly, I'm looking out at all these students and I'm looking for the ones that looked like me. You know, who weren't the straight-A student, who weren't the quarterback, who weren't the star students, but they're the ones on the edges, on the fringe. And so I try to encourage them that they have a gift, and I try to, to speak to them and give them hope that I know God gives a gift to everyone. I honestly believe every person has something. You can find Richard's new book, Fiona, It's Bedtime, wherever books are sold. If you'd like to hear more stories about allowing God to shape our dreams and desires, check out our interview with actress and producer Rita Wilson. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we speak with author and Food Network star Melissa DeRabian. Throughout her life, Melissa's seen that sharing a table with others does more than just feed our bodies. God can use the table as a place where He can use others to fill our souls. That was the beauty of what Jesus did in his compassion with food. It wasn't just the big miracles and the, and the feeding of the masses. Jesus shared a table with the marginalized and shared lives with them. Do you love hearing these stories of faith weekly from people like you whose lives have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling Stories of Faith podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like what you're hearing, leave us a review so that we can reach others with these inspirational stories. And you can also see these interviews on video as part of our original web series, with a new interview premiering every other Sunday on Facebook Live. Find previously broadcast interviews on our YouTube channel on IGTV or on JesusCalling.com slash video.